Hey, Dame. Yo. Do you happen to have any idea who this episode is brought to you by? <laughs> oh, I think I have a clue. I think I know. <laughs> this episode of Ergo is brought to you by Overcast, an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls, just a great podcast app for everyone. And if you know Ergo, we love independent and we love shit not being locked down. So <laughs> so go ahead and get Overcast for free on the App Store. Hi there, this is friend of the show and self-proclaimed honorary third Ergo host, Eve Ewing. This year, I curated a series called the Black Freedom Lectures, which was dedicated to talking with renowned Black scholars to share knowledge and spark discussion on topics with an explicit Black liberation lens. We sat down with the speakers after each lecture and had some great conversations. And throughout the month of August, we're sharing those conversations with you as special episodes of Ergo. So today you're going to hear a Q&A of me interviewing one of our guests. If you want to learn more or if you're curious to see the original lecture, visit our website, blackfreedomlectures.org. If you don't want to do all that, I promise it will still be a great conversation. On this episode, you'll hear from C. Riley Snorton talking with me about Black trans histories. Enjoy. Please join me in welcoming my esteemed colleague, C. Riley Snorton. Professor Snorton is a professor of English language and literature at the University of Chicago with a joint appointment in the department in the Center for Gender and Sexuality Studies. Uh, professor Snorton is a cultural theorist who focuses on racial, sexual, and transgender histories and cultural productions. He's the author of a couple of great books. One is Nobody is Supposed to Know, Black Sexuality on the Down Low, and Black on Both Sides, A Racial History of Trans Identity. Um, if you didn't get a chance to already catch our video that dropped last week, you can hear Professor Snorton read from the preface of Black on Both Sides. And some of those comments are going to frame our conversation today. Um, the book Black on Both Sides has won a lot of amazing prizes, including the Lambda Literary Award for Transgender Nonfiction, the Sylvia Rivera Award in Transgender Studies, an honorable mention from the American Library Association, shout out to librarians. And uh, Snorton is also the co-editor of Saturation, Race, Art, and the Circulation of Value. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Snorton. Yay, people are oh. clapping for you <laughs> and celebrating you. I also see that you have a really great uh, hoodie on that's made oh, by... Yeah. Yeah. Our, our collective, our shared friend, Pigeon Pagonis. And if folks don't know, uh, you should go get your own cute, too cute to be binary uh, shirts and hoodies on Pigeon's page. Um, how are you feeling? I am hanging in. Um, and I just want to say thank you uh, for the invitation to be in conversation. I want to thank folks who are tuned in and listening. Um, and I want to thank you also for providing that moment for some collective grieving or perhaps to collectively feel enraged um, in this particular moment. Um, it happens to also be, uh, I believe, National Day of Gratitude. So I think oh. it's kind of uh, appropriate to start with some thanks, even as uh, we're holding a whole set of emotions all at once. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. And I think that it might sound discordant, but for me, gratitude is one of the things that keeps me going on days like today because yeah. I know that um, our community is really strong and that we are organized and that we are prepared to show up for each other in the ways that are necessary. So um, I also want to welcome our ASL interpreter, Barb, and, and say that I'm really grateful for her being here. And also to say thank you. I promise I'll stop since you said it was gratitude. Uh, also to say thank you to the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture for making this conversation possible and the Mellon Foundation and all of our amazing um, staff and partners who've made it possible for you and I to hop on a computer and talk. Um, okay, so I have so many questions for you. I also want to let folks know that um, they can post questions in the chat and we will be if we have time. And if I don't run my mouth for an entire hour, I would love to ask questions uh, that, that people have. So please feel free to post questions in the chat. And I'm sure that um, Professor Snorton would be open to answering questions that are not just about the lecture. So if you have general, smart, interesting questions, please share them. Um, okay, so 
I'm going to be doing a lot of like, what did you mean by that? Because your lecture just dropped so much, um, so much truth and so much that really left me with a lot to chew on. So the first thing I want to ask you about is you frame your the preface of your book um, by talking about what you call the necessary simultaneity of Black liberation and trans liberation. I'm so proud of myself for saying the noun simultaneity, the necessary simultaneity of Black liberation and trans liberation, right? That one has to happen alongside the other. Could you just talk more about what you mean by that? Yeah, sure, sure. What a what a great way to get into the conversation. Um, so, you know, in, in, let me think about how I would start to, to unpack that. In one sense, what I'm suggesting is that if we think about um, gender as a, a kind of the modern system of gender as a colonial construct, that in many ways, and as the book kind of lays out in later chapters, um, necessitated, for example, kind of brutal experiments on enslaved black, black people. Um, which creates the conditions for for the possibility of something like transgender to emerge in the mid 20th century, then we see one of the one of the um, ways that blackness and transness are imbricated with each other or share a relationship with each other. Now, certainly it's not the same thing, but they are interrelated processes. And so if we think about the liberation of black folks, we also are also calling for a liberation to uh, the ways in which the colonial construct of gender has been mapped onto the ways that Black people experience themselves, but also as it continues to be a kind of ongoing site of pressure, of of violence, of a kind of rendering uh, uh, of proximity to um, premature forms of death um, that structure how trans people uh, maneuver in the world. Um, I think certainly, you know, by kind of talking through Laverne Cox's own kind of site of public grief, um, it really highlights also the ways that um, we see the kind of violence against trans communities as, in fact, being much more acutely attuned to Black and Brown trans people. And so these are, um, you know, uh, these are not only allied, but um, they are they are implicated political struggles. Are you saying, tell me if this is an incorrect rephrase of what you're saying. Are you saying that we should understand the invention of something like blackness or the black as a category and the invention of something like gender and, you know, binaristic um, yeah. categories of gender as both happening at the same time through the same colonial project would that be accurate that's 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 great and i would say in addition to that um that you know the the kind of uh, sexual scientists the ones who are who are developing what it is that we take as um the kind of precepts or the kind of you know uh, ways of thinking about gender as being mapped on to anatomy and et cetera, right gender and sex that those folks were also deeply involved in eugenesis projects right mm-hmm. so that the, the kind of the the pathologization of transness and blackness are happening simultaneously as well literally by the same people the exactly. same folks that yeah that's really i really appreciate that framing and i think that um One of the things I think that is powerful about your work and about your book is the idea of exploring Black trans histories. I think that um, because many of us grow up in a very um, patriarchal society, which we'll talk about, and a very kind of gender repressive society, that people think transness like just got invented (laughs) or this came out is a new thing. Could you talk a little bit about um, some of the the trans people, Black trans people moments in Black trans histories that you write about in your book that folks should go look up and learn more about? Yeah, no, I mean, I think part of the reason for looking at the past, but there were really two reasons that I wanted to write a history. One was uh, precisely a kind of reaction to the idea that trans people are new. And it seems like, I mean, if, even if you look at the 20th century, like people thought trans people were new when Christine Jorgensen becomes this kind of celebrity figure in the early 50s. But then, you know, it gets reinvented over and over again. One might say that people rediscover trans people whenever there's a kind of uh, emergence of a trans celebrity. Hmm. The other reason, though, is that like um, I was deeply uh, interested in thinking about what kinds of strategies for living did did Black trans people 
deploy in the past that we might um, we might be able to think through and use and um, be inspired by in the present and in the future. Uh, and so some of the figures that have been so um, meaningful and exciting to learn more about um, include trans figures who come out of the 1950s or who we know about from their lives in the 1950s, um, who have often been um, uh, not given their due attention in trans histories, um, but who are, you know, there are people like Carlette um, uh, Brown, who's a shake dancer in Harlem, who um, is like really actually trying to seek a, a, a getting out of the country in order to get her uh, proper, uh, you know, the kind of medicalized surgery that she was interested in. Um, there was uh, another woman named Carlette who's actually from Chicago. Two Carlettes. Yeah, this is the story <laughs> of two Carlettes. A uh, popular name must be in the 50s. So, um, yeah, so this is a story of a Carlette from Chicago who um, famously told the court, like, if I'm a man, then I don't know that, nor does mm. my community. And mm. so, um, you know, there are just all of these stories where, I mean, often we don't know about them except by the ways that they were criminalized. So we get, get them through court records and the kind of sensational media stories that were told about them. But in these stories are also like these, these like um, beautiful and inspiring moments of people talking back, talking mm -hmm. back to the state that that is um, uh, attempting to construct them other than how they see themselves. Um, I'd also say that some of the most fascinating um, work was looking at um, stories of Black trans folks living in the 19th century. And one of the, uh, a kind of chilling um, artifact, which is a pickup notice, a notice that people used for, uh, to, to enlist slave catchers or mm. uh, to um, um, find uh, formerly enslaved Black people who had escaped and bring them back uh, to their enslavers. Uh, there was a pickup notice of a person who, um, you know, they were like, believes, believes, she she well I'm gonna I'm gonna use the pronouns that I feel most comfortable sure. with. Sure. Believe she's a woman, believe she's free. And and to like see those those sentences side by side in wow. this notification of a person who was who was um in jail and and awaiting the kind of possibility of whether or not they were going to be um uh brought back to their enslaver. These are the kinds of stories that populate and 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 live across uh, black on both sides. That, that juxtaposition, believe she's a woman, believe she's free, is yeah. astonishing. And it points to something you said a minute ago, which is how do we look at these histories for exemplars of, of the freedom dream, right? Yeah. And I, that's something I want to touch on more because I think a lot of what you were pushing towards in your lecture was ways of thinking about Blackness and transness that is not about... Um, seeking state inclusion. Right. And uh, I have really detailed notes on this. Uh, you, you wrote the quantified abstraction of black and trans deaths reveals the calculated value of black and trans lives through state grammars of deficit and debt. And what you're calling for is, uh, is, is the opposite where you said media focus on trans people's abilities to use the bathroom of their choice obscures a more urgent conversation about what modes of dispossession are possible under the ruse of state inclusion. What would a trans politics in theory look like that refuses such murderous inclusion? Yeah. Um, so I could just quote back smart things that you said for a long time, but help us unpack that. What yeah. do you, and how do we think about, this is a big one, I think, for all marginalized peoples. How do we think about our sense of aspiration uh -huh. beyond a desire for inclusion uh -huh. in the same systems that dehumanize us? Uh -huh. Right. So uh -huh. what are we what else? What else is there? Help us see something else, Riley. What else should we be asking for? Mm. So I want to. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm tempted to go with uh, several different metaphors. One about what does it mean to try to get a seat at the table when the table is broken? Mm -hmm. One about what does it mean to try to get into the house when the house is on fire? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm thinking, right, like uh, the kind of project of inclusion is often freighted by this idea 
that somehow by including, we also will be transforming and making that very space better. Right. While at the same time, we survive by way of other modes and other systems. And so I think part of the project in Black on Both Sides, and especially in this current moment where we're seeing uh, a proliferation of anti-trans bills at the state level everywhere, right, is, um, you know, it is about um, looking to and valuing differently the kinds of structures of support that make Black and trans survival possible. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, some of that is about the various ways that we've already provided roadmaps for thinking about other ways of survival, other ways of safety, other ways of uh, mutual aid. Um, and, And so the pivot can't be what does it mean to... Um, you know, become a full citizen in 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 a a a state that, in many ways and through many um, functions and institutions, uh, uh, is, is able to maintain itself by way of uh, our, our devastation. Of exclusion. That's right. right. Um, and so this is this is the kind of language of deficit and debt. Like we, you know, this is also the ways that capitalism works. That like right. um, it is to say, uh, sometimes inclusion is about making what. Sometimes inclusion can become a way to further expose oneself to technologies of extraction, to technologies of of dispossession. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I, you know that is inclusion, like people really want it, you know, they really want to be part. And it's the thing that we're trained to want. It's the thing that we're told to want. And I wonder, relatedly, I wonder how you resist um, the idea. So one idea that we just, I think you just kind of disabused us of is the idea that like freedom means inclusion at at a poison well. Um, Another thing I, I would love to hear your thoughts on is the idea that uh, the what we should aspire to is the visibility of our own demise, right? Like that the more videos and the more uh, kind of graphic representation of death, um, it, the, the better. And I think that for trans people, this is obviously, a spe- I think for all Black people, this is salient. For trans people, this is really salient because how do you, on the one hand, strive for recognition? How do you strive for remembrance? How do you strive for acknowledgement, for memorialization, for all the things that we know our lost siblings are due, that they owe, that they are owed, while also not making that the totality of how uh, our bodies are seen. So help us through that. I think, you know, it's interesting. I was actually thinking about visibility as you, before you said the question, because I think, um, I often think about when we, when we, um, uh, consider when when we consider that what visibility can mean, we also think we also need to consider visible to whom. Right. Um, and so I think very often people are like, oh, so and so is invisible, but I'm like, but they're visible to me. They are cared right. for in these communities. Um, and so you know, I, there is uh, a, a kind of another another dimension for me in kind of the the research and writing and political work that I'm doing that's about. Um, holding a space where people can be honored and valorized without necessarily becoming instrumentalized. And I mm. think that that's some of the part, some, some of the trickiness of visibility. It's, it's, it's obviously um, um, something that many of us deeply care about, to feel recognized, to feel seen. But it's also that, um, and I think in particular when we think about things like um, the various ways that um, the 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 many deaths of black and brown, um, mostly trans women, have have been mobilized towards efforts where they are no longer in the room. They are no longer right. leading those efforts. They are no longer um, uh, their voices are no longer being heard. And so to kind of um, think that the kind of spectacle of violence somehow. Equal, we have to disarticulate that the spectacle of violence means justice for those who are most likely to be violated or to uh, to be um, uh, abused in 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 the kind of um, broader social. Yeah, especially because, as you said, we are already visible to those for whom we are beloved. Yeah, and 
the systems that harm us are already visible to us, right? And so this idea of like uplifting the visibility of those things, it, I think you're really prompting me to think about to, to whom, for whom, and for what ends. Right. And it doesn't mean that it's never good or purposeful to, to kind of, you know, work on this issue of visibility, but it's like, for what, right? Um, there's a moment, you already mentioned uh, the iconic Laverne Cox, um, and there's a moment in your lecture as well as in the preface where uh, you talk about an interview that Laverne Cox is doing and she, she kind of interrupts um, the flow of time by she's doing this interview and she, she stops the interview to, to acknowledge that she is in mourning. And you said she is challenging teleological notions of progress. Can you explain what that means to people who may have never heard the word teleological before and why it matters? I mean, I think the quickest way to describe it is that like um, she is she is um, purposely disrupting an understanding of time as moving from point A to point B and the logic that we experience change over time. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite ways of thinking about that is actually in the work of Invisible Man, where the unnamed protagonist says that he experiences time like a boomerang, Mm. that it keeps hitting him, right? And this is how he knows how he's located in time, not as a kind of um, A to B progression or on a linear progression, but rather that time can, can work very, most often works in a cyclical fashion. It's kind of like, that's like an echolocation version of time. I've been writing this book about Afrofuturism for like a million years. And one of the things I think one of the, if I, if I ever finish, hopefully I finish it, but you know, I'm not going, I'm trying, I'm trying out here, but um, to me, one of the most important ideas in Afrofuturism, as I understand it, because part of why I like to write about Afrofuturism is that it's unsettled. So in my, I get to make an argument. So my vision of Afrofuturism, exactly what you said is really important, which is, I think that black people have always had a very nonlinear vision of time. Um, and I think that there's so much that becomes possible uh, when we stop thinking about time that way. One of one thing that it reminds us to do is to is to resist the notion of progress that you're talking about. And I have to say, with love and respect to people who use this phrase, one of my least favorite phrases is like, "I can't believe this is happening in insert uh-huh. insert year here." Right? And people said it. Ten yeah. years ago, they said That's it. Right. 12, five years ago, and it's like at some point, maybe the year that it is doesn't matter, <laughs> right? That's maybe right. this eternal return of the same yeah. thing. There's not a question there. I just want to talk about Afrofuturism. But if you want no. to say anything about Afrofuturism, go for it. Well, also, you know, um, big, 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 big uh, admirer, reader, student of. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying as well was just making me think a little bit about, you know. Uh, so often how we experience time is, 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 is as it's invented by, for example, capital in the, in the, set, set, in the sense of the time of work mm-hmm. or as it's mm-hmm. invented by the state as in it's also tax day, right? That like right. there's all these ways that like um, if we think about time, if we, un, if we unsettle time we also get to be inventors of time too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So Two things before I ask you my next question. One, I want to remind folks that if you have a question, you can post it in the chat. Second, this is a great time to mention because we've been talking about how incredible your book is, that we will actually be um, giving away some copies of your book. And so if you are watching this video and you want to tell us what you think of our conversation, there's a really, really short feedback form you can fill out. And we'll be sending it out uh, through our newsletter, which is at blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter. If you sign up for the newsletter, we'll send out the feedback form uh, probably on Monday and you can get a copy of Dr. Snorton's incredible book. And we'll be purchasing those from Semicolon Bookstore, which is a black owned bookstore here in the shy. So um, so another, another word that you use in your lecture that some people might not know, but that I think is really helpful is the idea of sociogenesis. Everybody's going to come away from this talk about it. Like, I hope everybody has their vocabulary <laughs> notebooks out. Yeah. What is sociogenesis? And why is that a helpful concept for us to, why is it a helpful word for us to know? So um, sociogenesis is a term that is, comes out of uh, phosphonol. um, And the 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 OG. That no, people exactly, OG. exactly. The only the only epigraph of the preface in the book, uh, <laughs> the, the, the problem under consideration here is time. Um, 
you know, and and part of what he is doing in Black Skin, White Masks is uh, setting up an understanding of like there is no no way of understanding an individual's pathology without also thinking about what is pathological about the culture or culture or about the social. Oh, you already so said nothing about a word today. Because, <laughs> wow. Right. Right. So like, so it's, it's about the inextricability of the self and the social. And so part of then uh, the way that that term gets taken up and by example, by, for example, Sylvia Winter is to say, well, if we're talking about there is no necessary distinction between an individual and a, and, and a, and a, a kind of larger social collective, then we get to reinvent what it means to be, for example, a human, what mm-hmm. it means to be in the, and, and, and this is what, you know, I feel like is part of, of, of what, um, uh, Blake Brockington was doing in his political organizing, right? He was like redefining what it means to be trans in relation to his particular social setting in North Carolina as a Black activist, as a trans activist. So I, I hope that that kind of begins to, to um, demystify that term a bit more. Yes, I love it. I wrote making a we, right? It's like how we make yeah. a we collectively in space. Yeah. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about Blake Brockington and and about his story and why it's a story you wanted to include in the book? Yeah. Um, if you feel mm, able to do so. You know, book. it's a it is. I mean, I, I want to take on the question. And I also feel like in thinking about Blake Brockington, it makes me think about um, the, the, the the situation of, of of today and sitting with what is it? You know, um, one way of, of beginning to respond is to say that. Um, I believe 33 is considered the age of uh, of elder, like being an elder status as a trans person, um, given uh, uh, the set of circumstances in which so many folks are prematurely um, murdered uh, or, or die. And so um, I remember seeing the news stories of Blake Brockington um, winning, uh, the homecoming award. And I was just like, you know, uh, whatever, uh, like interested in that as a piece of news. Right. Um, and then I remember, uh, seeing the news of, of his death and thinking about at that time, probably just uh, at the time of like seeing that probably had just become, you know, elder status as a mm. trans person. Um, and thinking about, you know, what I think Janet Mock also um, has said so beautifully in Redefining Realness that is about like, you know, the context of do, being politically aware and uh, being oriented towards Black and trans survival and thrivance um, is a way of sitting also with survivor skill. Um, and, you know, uh, Blake grew up in North Carolina. I uh, spent a lot of my childhood in South Carolina, and I just really wanted to um, meaningfully reflect, to reflect and to insist on honoring his life, um, especially as so much of what you would find online even now is oriented around his death. But I think it was also about imagining what it would have been like for us to have had some kind of a other mode of sociality if i if you know like that like what would like the comp to imagine what those conversations are like and i think in some ways you know this black on both sides and and some of the newer work that i'm i'm thinking about is like what does it mean to honor the dead what does it mean to learn from ghosts what does it mean to live with ghosts um and blake is just a really um a really important uh person to me Mm-hmm. Um, you know, since the book uh, came out, I've, I've met so many folks who have been friends of Blake. And mm-hmm. um, that's been some of the most uh, incredible conversations where, uh, you know, in some ways to to briefly return to our conversations that we were having about visibility, you know, it was about the um, often um, uh, and, and very reasonable, uh, fear that so many, um, trans people have about being misremembered, uh, in their, in and after their death. And so for, for that to be there and for people to let me know about their relationship with him, 
um, it really amplifies the kind of stakes, both political mm-hmm. and ethical, of um, what it means to name um, some of these folks who um, we continue to be in community with through other spiritual modes. And it really, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And second of all, I think it really highlights what we were talking about a minute ago in terms of visibility, because um, there's a form of remembrance that is making someone visible on the terms through which they desire their visibility. Um, And I think that that's really important. Um, And yes, also very interested in what it means to continue to have these relationships spiritually with, with our folks after they're gone. And I think that when we lose people, it amplifies the necessity of, of that, right? Like you have to have, you have to develop some sort of spiritual or ancestral practice. I think, um, I'm going to ask you a few more questions and then we have a couple, uh, audience questions. So, uh, this is my last vocabulary question. I promise. Okay. Um, no Talk to us about the word tranifesting, uh, yeah. which is a great portmanteau that you mentioned in the in the preface. Yeah. So first, shout out to Kai Green and Tre- uh, Trevor Ellison for developing the term. Um, and uh, their sense of it is that kind of collective sense of self determination. Um, and so uh, it was it, it felt important to. Um, also highlight that there is language that is already in circulation about what it is that's at stake. And there's a lot, you know, there's a big conversation and maybe some of the questions that people have are about thinking about the kind of um, uh, shared desire for self-determination among trans folks and among Black folks. Um, But that was was a gesture of community incitation. Um, And also a way of saying, um, again, that like, what that, that that people are generating the language to name what it means to live in extraordinary and unimaginable circumstances. Yes, thank you. That was I. I was like, I'm so glad I learned this word today. Um, so one of the things you mentioned, um, HB two, and and also the more recent spate of anti-trans legislation, and in the education community, I want to shout out um, some of my colleagues. Um, who have done a lot of work uh, to try to really highlight the way that this legislation specifically targets young people. Right. Um, could you talk about what what do people need to know? I know this is not your, you know, totally you're not a legal scholar, but you are a very knowledgeable person. What do people need to know about the these legal fights over the rights of trans people to live their lives unencumbered that are happening right now? So, um so first, let me say that my my um, my political orientation is is for the complete decriminalization of trans people, right? Um, and that these bills are, look very differently. Some of these bills uh, are about restricting trans people's movement, i.e., whether they can go to the bathroom. Some of these bills are about, um, and you know, there's a particular bill that I think is is uh, in fact just being discussed today that about teachers having to report if young people yes. are trans. Yes, engaging, um, looping in teachers as kind of carceral agents of the state. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so, you know, they have a lot of different particularities and the fight to respond. I mean, I, you know, shout out to Chase Strangio um, and a number of folks who have been doing this uh, this work through ACLU, through Trans Law Center, through Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. But what's, what I understand to be needed is that they're going to have to take it to each state uh, and do uh, a, a kind of court proceeding. There's a lot of labor and uh, resources that are needed to respond to this slate. And I hope that these organizations are ones that people will consider supporting. Um, Can you tell us of, if there's one in particular that's your favorite that that folks should go look up and drop some coins if they can? Um, I, I don't want to pick favorites, but okay. I'll say those names again. <laughs> Everybody get your pens out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm going to, I'm lifting up the national, uh, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. I'm, I'm lifting up Transgender Law Center. And I also want to say that there's a really strong um, uh, trans advocacy um, a division in the ACLU. In the ACLU. Got it. Okay. Got it. You know, as, as I'm hearing you talk, I I think right away of the, the iconic uh, quote from our 
our always mother, Toni Morrison, yeah. and the reminder that the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. And that idea of distraction is what comes to mind, right? When I hear about this, this push, this wave, mm-hmm. because it is um, it is such a waste of the time of so many talented people, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and it's really... It's, I think that that's a, another form of hurtfulness. The, the most direct hurtfulness is, is the ongoing criminalization of, of trans people and trans young people and trans people of all ages that we know compiles upon these other systems that we're already talking about, right? Yeah. Um, but man, like what a waste of time. Yeah. Like what a massive waste of time. It's really yeah. frustrating, really frustrating. Yeah. yeah, it's super frustrating. It occurs as pressure. You know, it's like when you're, we, it's so often we've been talking about living um, in and with a COVID pandemic, while right. also living in a, a kind of epidemic of uh, state violence, an epidemic of, of anti-trans, um, uh, I, the word that I always, often use is animus because it kind of mm-hmm. it's a scaffold for all Contempt. kinds of mode. Yes. exactly, mm-hmm. um, and anti-black uh, animus and yes. violence. And so, you know, we're, it's like, what is, it, it's almost, it's like, um, in some ways it's like feeling like you're in a pressure cooker. Yes, right? yes. And, and then also then like imagining then all the kinds of folks who have to be marshaled just to turn it down a little bit, just right. to deal with, um, uh, you know, the bill that is coming up in one particular state, because each of these are going to take their own legal strategy and legal team. And I hope that the educators who might be watching this really think about the ways that our schools are already set up to normalize the surveillance criminalization of our young people that facilitates, um, it makes it really easy to engage in something that is truly evil and um, truly immoral under the guise of, I'm just following the rules. I'm just doing my job, right? And that we're asking teachers as state actors to put, potentially put their jobs and their livelihoods on the line and make a decision, right? But that's a decision. That's a decision you have to make, right? Um, so I really, I want to call on folks to think about that and to be be prepared to be courageous, you know? Yeah, um, I'm going to ask you three more questions from me and then two more questions uh, okay. from, unless uh, I think just two more questions, well, possibly okay. more. Oh, good. Okay. Somebody asked the same question that I was about to ask, uh, which is this person and I would like to know, um, we said, we really appreciate your idea of entanglement as not quite the same thing as solidarity. Could you talk mm. about that more? Shout to that person. We're right here. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been um, wondering about what it would mean for us to truly see each other as ourselves. And I think often solidarity is, um, I think it's powerful. I think it's beautiful. I, I, I often sign my, my um, you know, emails in solidarity with, with meaning. Um, but I often think solidarity is about saying, well, these are my issues and these are your issues and we're going to come together. Mm. And so I've been trying to think about what entanglement offers that is um, that ratchets up the stakes of solidarity in a certain way where it's like, honestly, as I understand my situatedness uh, toward liberation, it cannot happen without you. Mm-hmm. And so this is the language that I've been 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 reaching toward. Um, but I also think, you know, it's a way of thinking um, thinking about like, not just who do we bring and what do we bring to the table, but what do we have to give up mm. in order for, for this other new world to emerge? And so, you know, so much of, um, what this moment of living in the, in the public health pandemic and the global public health pandemic has meant for me has to been to be really a, a, a kind of, um, um, better student of abolition. And, um, and I think from that framework, I've been thinking entanglement and I've been thinking about all the things we gain by losing some of the things that we might might imagine are, con- are important to how we identify ourselves. All the things we gain by losing the things that we imagine are important to how we identify ourselves. That's that's really incredible. I also really like the word entanglement because 
we can't because Jada Pinkett Smith has now forever <laughs> redefined how we think about entanglement. So it's it's also kind of like a like a wink and a nod to yeah. black people. Like, ah, you know, <laughs> entanglement. Um, yeah. So um, I want to build on what you just said, because you you shared that this year has created a pivot point in your thinking about the relationships between blackness, transness and abolition as interrelated practices. Could you tell yeah. us more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the um, one of the key ways that I see the those as interrelated practices is through um, you know something that I'm I'm really really in the kind of early phases of trying to work out, trying to wrap mm-hmm. my mind around, which is like what what's possible by embracing a political. Um, um, and political imperative, a political thinking of it as a as a as a kind of benefit to us to operate from the principle of uncertainty. Hmm. That like, what is it? What would it look like if it wasn't that we were trying to say, oh yes, trans people should be here and non-binary people should be here, but to really sit with uncertainty as a way of organizing what we think we know about our gender and anybody else's gender. Hmm. And so I've been thinking about. Um, you know, this is this is in, in some ways born out of some conversation, uh, a kind of conversation that I've been sitting with for a while where people were kind of around the dinner table talking about like, oh, this is pre-COVID. We were around the dinner table, but we were talking about. <laughs> I was judging. Um, I was yeah, definitely yeah, yeah. judging. I was like, you know, uh, um, uh yeah, we were talking about like what would trans like how would we have something where trans people actually got to live more livable lives? And you know, one person said, Well, like I think it'd be meaningful if we could really get to acceptance. And I was like, mm. <laughs> I, <laughs> because I, you know, it's like I think part of it is that like um I, I think so much of what is uh uh so hard. In, 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 in surviving as a person who lives with multiple identifications that are um, targeted is um, the way that, um, you know, the kind of engine of security and of the, of the carceral state is the idea of being sure about something. Mm. And as, as acceptance still requires a thing like, oh, I know this thing and now yeah. I've, I've slotted this thing into being. It still can exist within any sort of sense of ordering. And I'm I want to say, what if we actually were like, I've got to actually embrace. I actually feel like I'm entangled with you and I don't know for certain under what conditions it is that we are going to develop. What other modes then would we have for what it means to even be related to each other at all? And Mm -hmm. so that's the kind of stuff that I've been really just trying to wrap my mind around and doing it by um, moving into a project that's about um, inhabiting swamps. Um, swamp. oh, like a writing are, project? Are you writing yeah, about swamps? Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we, thanks. And also we, we need to keep talking because, you know, I mean, th- some of it is also about swamps as this place. It's not land, it's not water. Right, right. It's a non-binary place. So like, what does it mean then for people to go and inhabit this space that's known for being so difficult for human life? I think some of that might actually give us a, um, some vocabulary for thinking about uncertainty, the to refuse the sense of knowing um, as the um, as the like, you know, necessity for building uh, political, political strength, political relation. Um, so, yeah, I'll pause there, though. Oh, my gosh. You just gave me so much. Like, like first of all, I think people who are interested in like le- this idea of a liminal space between land and water, the book, The Black Shoals by Tiffany yes. Lathabo King is a great yes. book that folks should check out. Um, as a Midwesterner, my interest in swamps is purely academic, but I am with you. I'm entangled with you in your swamp, uh, inquiry. Yeah. I don't want to go, but okay. I'm, but I will defend to the death. You're right. <laughs> to the swamp. I, I'm into it. And I think that the other thing that emerges from what you're saying to me is, um, I think that like, you know, now everybody, the, the phrase white supremacy is now like a more prevalent than ever before. And one of my friends said to me yesterday, I don't, I think a lot of people don't know what they're talking, like what right. they're saying when they say white supremacy. Yeah. And, and I said, well, part of what we're trying to do is move the average. Right. So if people, if, if more people understand more than what they did, I'm okay. I am okay with that. But I want to highlight something you said, which is that to me, one of the many 
insidious instantiations of white supremacy that is maybe less visible is the idea of like completely knowing something, uh-huh. right? The idea of that you can capture, fully understand, okay. categorize, hold, own uh, something entirely is to me um, a, an idea that comes from kind of white Western orthodoxy. Um, the idea of cataloging things infinitely, right? Putting them in museums, measuring skulls, and the idea that there's that there's that there's not space for kind of an infinitely unknowable sacred, or what you're calling the uncertain. You know, I think is um, is is really something worth pondering. And now I want to get a shirt that just says like I'm I'm, I'm uncertain, which is how <laughs> I feel all the time about everything. Right. Um, so thank you for that. Me too. <laughs> I'm so un- I'm so uncertain. Um, one of the, the our audience members wants to know if you don't mind returning briefly to this question about the the legal battles that are happening. What is it about this moment? Why do you, why now do you think that there's a, this moment that these laws are being enacted? And what do you th- just what does that what does that represent or reflect to you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, in one sense, I think you know, Morrison has it right. It is about a certain kind of distraction. I think in another sense, it's, um, you know, we, hmm, I don't, so, so this is, this is, I'm putting this out as a hypothesis. I'm ready. We're in, <laughs> we're, we're, we're yeah, in certain, yeah we're but in I, I think that we're also in a particular kind of transitional time where, um, you know, we have uh, in the U.S. Uh, the uh, kind of new presidential uh, outfit, but we also, live in a time where uh, uh, there there has been um, more continuity than we then there's a lot of continuity in terms of the same kinds of white supremacists, anti-trans, et cetera, as a kind of mobilizing tool for um, for, 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 for politics in, in this country. And so I think in some ways they also seem like easy wins. Like, yeah, like this will help rally our base, mobilize right. our base, satisfy our base. Um, but I'll also say this, that like, I don't often allow myself to dwell in what is the rationale for producing mm. that kind of thing. I often think like when, when something is, um, you know, is, uh, it, the impact of something is 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 misery that is a kind of um uh, kind of attenuated form of terrorizing particular groups i often i i find that i often like i actually don't want to know how they link those things up yeah yeah um uh but but i do think it i do think that it's seductive for some it's a, yeah. it, you know like the fact of it's of it's being so plentiful means that it's um it's it's useful for uh, a kind of um, marshalling of a group of people who are who imagine themselves to be disenfranchised in this movie. right, right, <laughs> which is a trip. I, yeah. It's a trip, and I think that I think that's right. Like you don't want to put yourself in that headspace too much, but you know, from a pragmatic perspective, they wouldn't do it if they didn't think it was effective. That's right. And to me, it's a cause to self interrogate because. Um, these things require a kind of mass mass support, right? Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it if they didn't think that enough people would at least not oppose it. And I think that, I think that it's really important to educate ourselves about some of these arguments around like sports and participation and all these things that in my view are predatory on people's very poor understanding of gender. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. if you understand something like binary sex and binary gender, then a question like, well, if these kids are allowed to be on the sports team with these other kids, then how is that fair? Right. And I think that it becomes a a, a moment to interrogate the 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 seemingly reasonable arguments, right? That are more, you know, I don't I don't hate these kids, but 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 is it is it fair? I'm like, is it fair that I had to be on a basketball team and I'm not good at basketball? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, is that exactly. fair? Exactly. No, I wanted right. to be reading books, you know. And yeah. so I think that, but but these things rest on a facile understanding of gender um, that I think people need to interrogate within themselves. And that, that brings me to another question I want to ask from the audience, um, which is how do we help people be aware? This comes from Tatiana. Hi, Tatiana. Um, 
how do we help people be aware that white supremacy is not the only system of oppression we're up against? How do we bring awareness to how patriarchy is enmeshed in global society? And also, this is a this is kind of a two part question, but I think the second part is also really important. How do we stretch our understanding of masculinities mm. outside of patriarchy? So those are two separate things, but I would love if you feel like yeah. you can tackle both. Number one, how do we help people get an intersectional analysis of white supremacy and patriarchy? And over here, how do we think about masculinity in ways that is not like violent and patriarchal? Or is that is that for you a useful exercise? Got it. Um, so the first one makes me think about bell hooks, right? The bell hooks has that, like, you know, like when bell hooks names the problem, she always names it as a as an ever-expanding compound, right? She's like white supremacist, heteropatriarchal, uh, classist, ableist violence. And I'm like, you know, it's like these these are when people are talking about white supremacy, right? Like white supremacy is also, right? Like in the yes. same way that race and gender are not, right? Are yes. not the same, but they, white supremacy, you know, requires patriarchy. It's a part yes. of it. It's a part of its engine to function. Uh, capitalism is a tool inside of also of white supremacy, right? So like thinking the simultaneity of those things is also to say that like, we say we're naming one thing, but we also... Um, are, you know, I think it's about increasing the awareness that saying one thing is also to always invoke these other things. That these right. are, these are uh, cast of characters in the same play. Right. So be like bell hooks is what you're saying. And don't be <laughs> yeah. afraid to make the list. That's right. Yeah. And it takes us back to, I'll let you get to the second part of the question, but yeah. it takes us back to where we started yeah. about part of your claim is actually you can't understand gender as a construct separately from understanding racism and race as a construct, separately from understanding gender as a construct, right? That these things are are co-created uh, as a colonialist, a violent colonialist white supremacist project together, part and parcel. It's like thunder and lightning, right? And so I think that's helpful, but also naming all the things. <laughs> be, yeah. be the bell hooks that you wish to that's see in the right. world and just name right. all the things. That's and right. could could you tackle that second question about are there ways to understand masculinity outside of patriarchy? And I I really appreciate this question. It's something, you know, I I would like to uh, be a parent someday. I'm a I'm a parental figure to many children that are not my own. I would like to be a parent someday myself, but I, I have a lot of friends with boys and I've been looking at them like, I don't know how y'all finna raise these boys. Like it's yeah. terrifying to think about if we want to move past something like to toxic masculinities, right? We just have so few models of what it looks like to think through maleness or boyness that is not about violence. So um, can you give us some or are we, should we abandon it altogether? <laughs> well, Mm, such a I abandon it. I mean, abandon masculinity as a no. Concept. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm I'm hearing everything that you're putting down, and it's something that I think about so much, and particularly as a non-binary and transmasculine person, because you know, in some ways, uh, it there are there are so many scripts that are offered up uh, by way of patriarchy, and and there's also that the reality of sexism. That is also not only like sexism is not something that only men have, right? We have to also right. tend to internalize sexism. So bringing it into the realm of parenthood is also something that I think is 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 really really important as a context here. And so I mean, if if we're going to talk about what does it mean to abandon, my first kind of question is like, what if we teach all our children that they're making their gender as they go? What if we teach all our children that like you know. Um, you know, I think one of the things we should abandon are like gender reveal because that's not. Oh, that is first of all you know, like, a menace, a menace to society, <laughs> and a menace to the forest. Exactly, right? a menace to the. Oh, enemy. and to y'all people, <laughs> y'all please stop endangering yourselves with these gender yeah. reveals. I yeah. beg of you, if you're watching this, don't yeah. do it. You will set a fire. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, I think you know, I think that that's I take that very um, seriously um, in in my own kind of transmasculine identification that I am making a kind of masculinity while also being attentive to, I have been socialized in this world, you know? Right. And so, um, you know, certainly uh, uh, it is about constituting a world in which we, each person gets to determine and then give language to, if they choose to, what it is that they, how it is that they are moving in the world with all various kinds of attributes. Um, 
I think I gave you a kind of thesis on gender abolition. No, it was amazing. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I think that's amazing. And I think that, I don't know, it's really, it's really hard because I, it's one of those things where once you start looking for it, you just realize how much it's everywhere and how much, as you said, how much we've internalized. Right. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's just terrifying. Um, so, so many good questions are rolling in. I do not want to keep you all night. If, if you have a question for Professor Snorton and I don't get to ask it this evening, um, please check Professor Snorton out on social media and, um, don't ask too many questions, but ask some questions. All right. I'm going to ask two more, um, before we go and want to remind folks one more time, you can sign up for our newsletter at blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter. And if you do that, you can get a form to enter a book giveaway and get a copy of black on both sides. Um, all right. Last two questions. Number one, this comes from Selena. Shout out to Selena. A friend said they don't believe solidarity is a thing because none of this is solid. There are holes, shaky foundations, et cetera. That was a bar, but then there's a question that comes with the bar. Mm -hmm. How do we align ourselves with things we support but may not fully understand? I think this is a really important one. How do we how do we forge alliances even when we don't fully understand somebody else or where they're coming from? Well, this this feels like it really echoes the conversation that we're having about uncertainty that like, you know, that that I think, you know, in, in terms of what it means to kind of develop oneself to be a student of something, it is like, what is it that feels ethically, politically urgent? And it doesn't quite matter, right? Like whether or not you can um, fully understand why it is that you then require a relation to do that which feels politically and ethically urgent towards the liberation and survival of um of of the communities that we are part of and care about yeah yeah i think that's right and if, you know one thing i would build say to build on that is that this is why relationship is so important and that if you are in relation with people you do not need to fully understand them in order to want to protect them. That's right. And I think that there are limits to, you know, empathy was probably like the most misused word of the, the TRUMP administration. Cause it's like, we need to have empathy, but empathy was the wrong people, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but I think that, that for if you are truly in relation to somebody, empathy can be an important pathway towards mm-hmm. saying, I, I got your back. I'm entangled with you, mm-hmm. regardless of whether I've read all the Fanon or the Twitter, <laughs> you know. Um, all right, Riley, I'm going to ask you one more question. And I want to say thank you so much for being such a gracious interlocutor and for teaching us so many vocabulary words, uh, for being so cool. Um, so what kind of you you talked a little bit about um about eldership right and about how um the the kind of the the terror of untimely demise faced by many young people who are trans forces us to think differently about eldership i i want to flip that and say that um maybe we can define even without the specter of early death right that maybe we can th- be thinking about our status as elders what kind of elder are you trying to be what kind of elder do you want to be um, share with us your aspirations for elderhood. Got it. I mean, I, I, I will shout out my mom on this one, who um, was so moving to me one day. She gave me a compliment and she was like, she was like, my favorite thing about you is that you're kind. And, um, you know, she was saying it in light of like something that had happened that was like really exciting for me professionally. But I take that um you know, I think about that all the time that yeah. like, for me, it's, it's most important um, to be kind, to be generous, to be with folks in ways that um, in all the ways possible are not about my ego, but mm. about what it is that we can build together um, to not be concerned about becoming irrelevant. <laughs> like, I don't care, <laughs> you know, like, I, like, I, I, you know, if the work is useful, that's great. I'm always interested in being the conversation, but it should not be about me. Mm. And so like, that's the kind of elder that I, that I, you know, um, am maturing into, I hope, but it's also something that I constantly have to orient myself around, you know, that I think that like, I guess another thing to say then too, is to like be intentional about right. the, 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 um, the values that, that I hold dear. Um, I love that question. I love that question. Thank you. I got it from listening to you. You know, I, I think that 
I actually feel I'm not going to strain it, but I actually feel that that is tied back to everything we've been talking about regarding gender, because um, I think that the basics that we learn like in preschool yeah. about how to be humans, right? Like be kind, mm-hmm. love each other, mm-hmm. love yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, don't hurt other people that those things are, there's a, there's a way in which I think those things get tagged as being um, feminine and, or like not rigorous and, or, antithetical to real intellect or intellectual projects, right? That those are heart things. And that if you're really smart, you're into head things. And I think that I'm just really, I think it's really important for us to reclaim a politic that is rooted in kindness, a politic that is rooted in love and making sure people are fed and making sure people are housed, you know? And I think it, it relates to everything you've been saying about mutual aid and just, just all of it. Um, Riley, thank you so much for being in conversation with me. Is there anything I did not ask you that you would really like to talk about or just like any shout outs you want to you wanna give? Yori, shout out your moms. So I did. I mean, <laughs> I've got some family on the call. Good to see you, fam. Um, but I, I also actually, um, if it's not too much trouble for y'all, I'd love to sign the books. So <laughs> something that we can make possible. We love it. <laughs> okay. Wow. Breaking right. news. Not too much trouble. No, it can definitely okay. make that happen. Definitely yeah. make that happen. Wow. Yeah. Um, People are so fortunate. I might have to slide and look for myself, get that little signature so I can That's keep that forever and ever. Um, thank you so, so much. Where can the people find you if they want to learn more about you and hear more about your work? Awesome. Great. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. And sometimes on Facebook. You can find Ooh, me. At- oh, bless your heart. <laughs> uh, but you can find me at C. Riley Snorton on all of those platforms. And I really do invite uh, more conversation. I'm so grateful for this invitation. It's always so good to talk to you, Eve. And Thanks. Um, it's such a, uh, it feels like some kind of solve in the midst of a day that has just been so full of grief. So Thank really you. Grateful. That's that's really how it feels to me too. And I'm I'm really grateful to be in community with you today and really grateful to everybody who joined us for this conversation. And we're so grateful to you, Professor Snorton, for kicking off this lecture series. Please follow us on all the social things at Black Freedom Lectures and check out our website, blackfreedomlectures.org. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you to the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. Thank you to the Mellon Foundation. Thank you to Barb, the realist out. Um, And thank you to you, Riley, for being here. Everybody, please take care of yourselves and each other.